Great day everyone, welcome to Visual Sly. For anyone who's familiar with this channel, it uh, used to be Melissa Sly Design, but we've recently rebranded and we are now Visual Sly. So welcome, old and new alike. Uh, this is going to be a tutorial going into a little bit more detail about line art and sort of like the coloring aspect uh, with Affinity. Uh, I can't say for sure how long this tutorial is going to be, I hope it's not too long or too boring, so we'll, we'll kind of see what happens. This is based off of the uh, comments from the last video, which was me just literally geeking out and freaking out about how cool Affinity Designer for the iPad really is. And I just kind of whipped up a little video in my excitement and that video got a lot of attention, which is really, really cool. So thank you for anyone who's seen it. And hopefully this video will be a lot more useful. Um, I'm taking advice from the last video about adding in some voiceover, so hopefully that will make it a little bit more entertaining <laughs> for you guys and a little bit more easy to follow. Um, so yeah, here we go. Affinity Designer is amazing. One of the comments was talking about, oh, well, I can't draw, which is not a problem. You know, I, I can't really draw either. I just kind of wing it and sometimes I get a cool thing, sometimes I don't, and that's all right. So. I whipped up a little sketch to use uh, for this tutorial, and I use the Apple Pencil, uh, which pairs really nicely with the iPad Pro. Um, I highly recommend it. It's worth the money, trust me. I will be doing a lot of stuff with my finger as well because it's just so responsive and it's really, really cool. To get started, from the basics, I've just launched Affinity Designer. This uh, square with the plus sign here is going to be how you get ready to start a new project. What we're going to be doing is importing from photos. So I have the sketch here that I did and um, basically uh, this is just like an original character I have from kind of like my own little creative world that I, that I kind of draw inspiration from when I, when I need it. Um, his name is Riddle and he's a robot um, and I figured he was a really easy uh, piece to start with because he's got a lot of really basic shapes so you have like you know the circles, the squares, triangles in his uh, fingers. Lots of really big, and his face, um, lots of really basic shapes um, so we can get really comfortable going through all the shapes. So first thing I did was I just tapped on the picture I wanted and Affinity Designer just makes a new project for me. If you're curious about how big your piece is, you can go to this picture here um, next to the arrow. It sort of looks like a piece of paper being flipped over and you can go to resize and down here at the bottom, Let's see what it looks like in inches. So, whew, this is gonna be a big piece. I don't think I necessarily want my piece to be that big. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave the lock on, which is gonna keep the proportions the way that they should be. I'm gonna just tap on it, and I'm gonna say, let's make the width just generally, I don't know, 10 inches. And that will automatically turn the height to about 13 inches. And I like to work with about 300 dpi usually, just because it gets you a little bit better quality. Um, you can scale up or scale down pretty easily with that number. Um, anything higher than that can cause lag. However, I will say that Affinity Designer really does not have much lag at all, which is amazing. We got everything pretty good to go. Once you've got all your settings done here the way you like them, you can tap the little uh, check mark and that will change your image for you. So now we're ready to start. So what I'm doing is I'm just tapping on the rectangle tool and the rectangle tool right away just gives me rectangles, which is, you know, yay, but we've got a lot of more complex shapes here that we want to be able to make. So if I tap and kind of drag to the little carrot symbol, I have all these shapes and they give you a lot of really nice base shapes. It's very different than um, Illustrator currently. Illustrator only has, you know, your, rect your rectangle, your ellipse, your triangle. Um, this one gives you a lot of really nice base shapes to work with. Why don't we go ahead and start with this, the ellipse. So I'm just, I got my pen still on the, the tablet here and I'm just going up and I'm letting go on ellipse. And you can see that right away we can make some ellipses. Some of the basic functions that we'll be kind of using a lot are do, creating and undoing. So what I'm doing is I'm just tapping, dragging out, and we can make nice shapes. And to undo, I'm just tapping two fingers on the screen. So creating is just tap and drag, two fingers to undo. Really, really simple. One thing I'll, I'll point out first of all is in the very bottom right here, we have a little um, uh, question mark. If I just hold that down, what's super, super helpful is that Affinity Designer will tell you literally everything on your menu. And it'll tell you kind of like the basic, just what it is, which is so helpful. 
I really wish that um, the Adobe Suite kind of had something like this that would just tell you like what each tool is. That would make it really, really easy to navigate. So Affinity does that for you, which is a very, very nice treat. So as you can see, and I'm just tapping and letting go, it's just a quick reference. So on the right hand side here, we've got what looks like a bunch of, piece of, bunch of pieces of paper stacked on top of each other. So I just tap on that and that this is my layers. Right now we have just the background layer, which is locked. I can just tap on it to unlock it, or I can go into this circle ellipses and relock it. And locking it means that I oops. Locking it means that I can't move it around. I'm trying to, to grab this shape and I can't move it around anymore. If I unlock it and I'm in sorry, and I'm in the uh, the move tool here, I can move it which isn't ideal, especially when you're starting to try and layer on your, your shapes. So let's go back a little bit here. Do, do, there we go. So let's go ahead and leave that layer locked. You don't want to have that one messing around. The most typical layer that you're going to be working with in Affinity Designer is going to be vector layers. Vector layers are just your basic shapes, lines, solids. They translate really nicely to .eps file types, um, which I'll, I'll get into that a little bit when we get towards the end of this tutorial. But basically, I'm going to make a new vector layer, and right away it gives me a new layer, and I can come over here and grab a shape, and draw a shape. And under that layer, we now have our first ellipse. Some of the other basics are going to be creating shapes and undoing. So what I'm doing is, with the ellipse tool selected, tap, drag out to start making a shape. I can make it really thin, I can make it really fat, really... Uh, Really wide. If I hold one finger down, it'll keep my scale proportionate, which is really nice. If I hold two fingers down, I can just move around my shape and then start resizing it. Let's say I, I decide, oh yeah, I want a circle for my for his eyes, but I don't think I want to have it over there. So I'll just hold two fingers down and I can just get really close. Oops, <laughs> and I can get his eye basically. So we create the shape. Oops, we create the shape with our ellipse tool selected and then two finger tap to undo. Or let's say I really like that circle, I can three finger tap and it will come back. So undo, two fingers, redo, three fingers. Really, really simple, really, really quick uh, design um, user interface, which I really, really like. Let's kind of zoom into his face. We'll start on his face because there's a lot of really good shapes here. First thing we'll start with is uh, his eyes. So when I'm working on shapes and building my shapes, I don't really like um, having uh, opaque or non-see-through shapes. So what I want to do first is I want to go to this, it looks like a circle with a slash through it. That's your color menu. And I can toggle between my fill and my stroke. So I'm going to have my stroke be red. And I'm going to go to the CMYK, actually I'm going to go to the RGB. I know that red is going to be 100% of the, uh, or 255, whatever, uh, percent of the red slider and zero on the green and blue. I mean, it's okay if you're not like really, really familiar with how the colors work. Affinity Designer is, you know, it's great for coloring and, and everything, and it takes a little bit of practice. There's a couple different modes that you can go through, um, to get your different colors. The color wheel is really nice, because you can just kind of spin around on the outside and get a color, and then you can decide what shade or tint you want it to be. Some people find that really useful. I find it pretty useful too. Um, I do like the RGB and the CMYK sliders though as well. So I'm gonna have my stroke red, and I'm gonna, under quick colors, we've got a circle with a slash through it. I'm gonna make sure that I don't have any fill. All right, so we can go to our stroke, and we can actually change how thick we want the edge of our circle, or any of our shapes or lines to be. So I'm gonna say five is probably good, and I'm gonna punch that in by tapping on point and just saying five. So now my uh, my point width is gonna be five for all of my shapes. So we double check, make sure our stroke is red and our fill is um, non-existent. <laughs> and then we come back over to our shape and close that. And there we go, we have a shape. And actually now that I'm looking at it, five might be a little bit too big. So I've got my shape selected. I'm gonna come back in here. I'm gonna say about three is, two or three is probably good. And now we can start kind of layering on his eyes here. Oops. Right. 
Should mention, you gotta be careful which tool you're using. So I was on the ellipse tool and I kept drawing a bunch of circles trying to move this circle. I've gotta make sure I'm on the actual move tool. Now I can move the shape around. One thing I can do is duplicate this shape really easily by holding down two fingers with it being selected as it is. Hold two fingers down and drag out and I've got a second shape. You'll notice that if I just try to put the shape right over top of the uh, where his little goggles are, I can't, it doesn't fit. I can't get it, it to fit. So there's this one little white circle up top here. That's your rotation. If I hold one finger down, it'll do precise angles. And if I let go, I can control how I want it to be. So I'm not exact, I, you know, I didn't design this with the exact angles in mind. So I'm gonna have it as the free free rotation. I'm just going to get it as close as I can. Hold two fingers down. Oops. Hold two. Hold two fingers down. Oh, it's making me look so bad. I promise it works. I promise. I don't believe I mentioned, but you can zoom in and zoom out. I'm just using the Snapdragon motion of my fingers. So I got two fingers on my screen. I'm pinching out. I'm pinching in to shrink out to zoom in and you can get really 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 close I don't remember exactly how how much of a percentage it's something outrageous like a thousand percent zoom or ten thousand percent zoom or something nuts like that it's it's kind of insane So I've got a bunch of my circles laid, and now let's go into some of the more angular shapes. There's a little bit more manipulation you can do with them. So again, I'm going to have my shapes selected. I'm going to tap on it, drag down towards the carrot to open up all the options. I'm going to do the triangles on his uh, face mask now. So click and drag out. We can make a nice triangle. Hold a finger down. We can have a nice, uh, more or less equilateral on its not quite equilateral, it's just nicely proportioned, I suppose. Um, so I'll just have one finger out, I'll drag out a nice rectangle. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> wow, I know my shapes. A triangle. You'll notice this shape has a red dot at the top here, and that's a different kind of manipulation point. So I actually don't know what it does for the triangles. It's, oh, it just moves it kind of along to the side. And that's actually gonna be really useful considering all of our triangles are uh, askew. So we've got our shape pretty much as good as we're gonna get it. However, we wanna be able to really, really get these the, point, the three points of this triangle to fit properly. So to do that, first thing we have to do is convert this to curves. So with the shape tool selected, down here at the bottom we say two curves. And then we come up to what's called the node tool. And what the node tool does is it allows you to pick up any point that you've drawn or created, and you can really, really get your shape to fit whatever your sketch might have looked like originally. And the only way you're gonna be able to get those is if you have your shape kind of turned into curves. Let me show you that again. I will make a new triangle Got a nice reformed triangle here. Now if I try to go right to the node tool, I don't have any points. I can't I can't do anything except my basic, oh look, I can move it side to side motion, which isn't what we want. So we have to make sure we've got the shape selected. Come down to the bottom here and say two curves. Now, with our node tool selected up here, we have control over our points individually. So I can just get my shape right like that. Let me go ahead and finish out the rest of his face here using that tool. And you'll notice that this shape here in the center is um, its a little bit different. So we'll get to that in a bit. But for now, let me finish out the rest of his triangles on his face. So if you're watching that fast forward a bit, I'm constantly learning new things about this program. I've only been using it for like about a week and a half or so. And already I figured out something cool. So 
with one of our shapes selected using the node tool. If I hold two fingers down, I can control the curvature of some of these sides. So that could be really useful depending on um, how you might foresee using such a feature. So we finished all of our triangles. Now, in order to make this nice shape here, uh, this diamond shape, we would make use of the pen tool. So with the pen tool selected, all I have to do is just tap on the screen and it will make a nice uh, line. And if I want to close the shape, which is useful for shading, I'll just tap on the original point. And there we go, we have a nice closed shape. We have a nice diamond here. Now that's not all the pen tool does. You can get really nice smooth curves. So I'm gonna zoom out here to the white section. I can, again, I can tap as much as I want to make some crazy shapes. Or when I wanna finish, maybe I want this side to be rounded. So I'm just, I tapped and I'm holding down and now I can round out my edge however, however I see fit. I can control, oops, I can control my shape, my points I should say, with these sort of like, um, I don't know what you'd call them, kind of like barbell sort of things or batons. I'm not really sure what you would want to call them. I don't really know what the professional term is for them. Uh, I call them the manipulators of my points because I'm fancy. And I can add those, like let's say I really want this shape to be rounded out, kind of like a nice rounded out C. I can select a bunch of my points and I can, down here at the bottom, we've got sharp, smooth, and smart. So smooth will give me, with those, um, when I select a point and I tap on smooth, it will give me these nice little anchor point baton shapes that I can use to, to kind of round out my curves a little bit more. Get a bunch of them curved, cool. And let's say that I don't really like the fact that it's rounding out, I can go back and sharpen them, which basically will take away my manipulation point, my manipulators on my points and make it angular again. Sometimes you'll wanna have a shape, let's say we wanna smooth out a couple shapes, or actually let's say we wanna smooth out all of our points on this shape. I can tap on one, hold one finger down, and I can select multiple points. You can do this with shapes as well. And we can smooth all of them out. And now we've got lots and lots of manipulators on our points to really smooth out the shape as much as we want it to be. Actually, let's see what happens. Let's do an experiment. Live on camera. Tap a bunch of them and hit smart. Smooth, smart. I don't know what it does, <laughs> but I'd be interested to know if you guys can make really good use of that shape. I mean, that um, smart function and <laughs> let me know exactly how it, it's super useful. I'm sure it is. All of our points right now, the manipulators are 180 degrees. So I'm grabbing the one on the right and I'm grabbing the one on the left and you can see that the opposite side one will always be 180 degrees from it. Sometimes you're gonna wanna have your manipulators a little bit more angled. So to do that, you can select one of them and then you can hold one finger down. And now you can kind of have your curve on one side and angle on the other side, so to speak. And you, I'll, as we're kind of going through, I'll show you how this is useful. But that's that's really nice. I can control exactly what I want my point to, to have going on with it like that. And if you want to reset it, you can just tap on smooth and it'll go back to the way it was. So that's kind of how that works. I'm gonna delete the shape. I've got it selected in my layers. I'm just gonna tap the little trash can icon. Those are some of the really basic uses of shapes and points. What I'm gonna do right now is fast forward again, kind of get more of this fleshed out. And as I go, if there's any sort of tips, I will definitely pause and speak it through. So right now my screen's a little bit cluttered and I'm using the 12.9 inch iPad Pro, uh, but I can imagine that this would be a lot more cramped if you're using the 10 point whatever inch um, iPad Pro. To kind of declutter your screen, in the very top right, 
there is an icon that kind of gets rid of a lot of the clutter. I mean, you're still using the tools exactly as they, they should be used, but it gets rid of a lot of the the menus and stuff so that your, your screen's a lot more open to work with. Um, that can be really useful when we get to the next step of actually coloring this, but I wanted to show you guys that. As I'm kind of going through here, you'll notice that my line work kind of looks like, like, oh, why did you go through his his faceplate like that? Like, that's really unattractive. Or like, why did you go through his eye like that? I'm doing this because it makes the coloring step easier. Um, and what I mean by that is I can kind of have my shapes kind of hiding a lot of my, my mistake line work because the, the way vector colorizing functions is it needs closed shapes in order to to get color to actually show up. I'm gonna pause in my line work and start actually coloring in a little bit so I can kind of show you what I mean. And that's where our layers come in really handy. Um, which right now it's kind of a big mess, but I'm gonna show you how to clean that up and make it a lot more attractive. I'm gonna select the shape. I know that this character is yellow, so right now I'm just gonna pick like a nice, oops, we've got the stroke selected, so we're gonna make sure we select the fill. I know that he is going to be kind of a yellow color, like a golden yellowy color, a little bit tarnished. He's, he's an old piece of equipment. It's kind of this nice golden yellow. And then I'm gonna go ahead and select that top shape there. In my recent colors, I've already got that yellow selected, which is so helpful. I love it. And make sure that that part is on top. So I'm just holding down and dragging up on my layer and you see this little blue bar? If I drop on another layer, it becomes kind of a sub part of that particular layer. We don't want that. We want it to actually show up on top. So we make sure that that blue bar is above that curve that's already colored in. So now when you look at it, you don't even see that, that messy line work up top here anymore. You just see the way it's supposed to look. So that's why I did that the way I did it. And we can do that to his face mask as well. Turn that yellow. Turn. Oops. Turn. Turn that part yellow. And you can see that that already automatically made the ugly line work underneath just totally disappear. So that's the reason I'm, I'm drawing the way I'm drawing. Um, You'll see this come a little bit more in handy as well when we start the coloring process. I know that his eyes are going to be kind of a reddish color. They're a very dark red though. Let's see. Red and a very, very dark and ominous. That's nice. Yellow. Whoops. And we can see that that one is on top. So we need to find where that shape is. Click and hold drag it to where the blue bar shows up underneath. And there we go. Turn that one yellow. I think he's on top as well. Nope, he's underneath. Perfect. These guys are all gonna be filled in black because they're actually holes in his, uh, his mask guard. So already he's actually looking a lot better. <laughs> in case, I just didn't want you guys to think like, oh, she doesn't know what she's doing. You're right, in some cases, but I, I, I do know what I'm doing with this. This is going to be underneath. That's actually it's going to be on top of those, but these guys are each going to be underneath. So to get to some of my other layers underneath, um, I can't, I mean, I know that they're supposed to be on top, so I could just hold down and drag them up on top, or I can turn off the layers that are hiding them, and I can come in here tap them one, hold a finger down, tap select all of them. It selects all of them in my layers palette as well. I can click and hold and it turns into kind of a group of layers and I can put all of those on top. 
And I can turn these back on and there we go, back where we started. So that's really useful as well. Something else that I tend to do when I'm working is like, now you can't see my sketch underneath anymore, which is really unfortunate. So uh, sometimes what I will do is I will make a copy of my sketch layer. One way I can do that is if I turn off the lock, tap and hold, and I'll get some options like uh, deselect, cut, and copy. I'm gonna say copy. So that just copied everything on that layer. I'm gonna scroll up here. Actually, let's see. I'm gonna scroll to right about here. I'm gonna come up and make a new vector layer. Oops, I decided to put it on top. That's fine. So we can just hold and drag it down. Do, do, do. Down, down, down. And put it underneath. So we can still see all the line work where I'm making the little spokes of his gear goggles. And now, with that new layer selected, tap and hold. And I can say paste. So now I've got another copy of my sketch that I can turn on and off when I'm working on detail parts that I need to be able to see. And we can turn, we can change the opacity of this layer as well. So we can make it a little bit translucent, which I think I'm going to probably go ahead and do. So I don't need to see everything about it. And I can come in and continue working. Just like Illustrator, there is uh, snapping, which means that the software is smart enough to realize when you're trying to line up points on top of each other. Like right now it's very free and I don't know for sure if I've got that point on top of the rectangle to line it up and make it like really, really nice and sharp. So in the bottom right, there is a magnifying, or I'm sorry, a, mag a magnet that turns on your snapping. So now it automatically knows, oh, you're trying to line it up right with that point. So I will go ahead and be smart and line it up for you. So that's really, really helpful. Um, it sometimes can be a pain, like if you forget to turn it off and you're really trying to get your shape to like line up a certain way and it just won't, that's probably because you have the snapping on. So it's you can have a love-hate relationship with that snapping, but it's it's very useful. All right, so I'm gonna pause here and talk a little bit about layer management. Oops. <laughs> um, so right now, this is a mess of a project. I don't know what anything is. I don't know where anything is. That is really, really, really poor of me to uh, not talk about this sooner. One of the most important things you're gonna wanna learn is naming things and getting layers organized. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna name my my sketches. I named my background. I was smart and did that. But I didn't name what this is. So I'm going to tap on it. I'm going to go to this ellipses. And I'm just going to tap on where it was named before. And I'm going to call this um, work sketch. And I just, I'm going to know that that means it's my, my semi-translucent uh, version of my, my sketch that I can use to kind of go around and get more details pulled out. All right, now I'm gonna come in. I know that all of these shapes, because they're all the, the ones that are black filled, I'm gonna tap each one, hold one finger down on the screen so I can multi-select, and I'm gonna make a new layer with these. Oops, that didn't work. I'm gonna select all of those, make a new layer. Oh. Unselected, and that's all right. So apparently, you should make a new layer first. But anyway, I'm gonna reselect all of these. I'm gonna put them in the new layer. Oh gosh, making me look bad. Affinity, goodness. All right, hold down, put those in the new layer, and I'm gonna call everything that goes in here 
face guard. So I've got the, the top tier of it selected, going to the ellipse, and I'm going to call it face guard. And already right away, this is helpful because I can turn on and off different parts of my project. I can, you know, move things around as a group. It's really, really useful. So I'm going to go ahead and clean up all of my layers now for you. Whew, there we go. So much better. So now I've got the head, the eyes, the face guard, the goggles, and my project is so much cleaner and I know what everything is. So make sure that you name your layers. Get in the habit of doing it now so you don't have to worry about doing it later, like me. So I'm going to go ahead and say, for now, just for the purpose of this tutorial, because um, I don't want it to end up being too long, I'm going to pretty much say that I'm like pretty much done with what I'm going to do for uh, creation on the actual sketch for now, uh, just so I can get to the actual, oops, just so I can get to the actual meat of it with, um, coloring because that's a really important part of or a really cool part I should say about this software. So I'm gonna go ahead and just finish up real quick with his band on his goggles and I know that they are brown so let's go ahead and get that cool slider. So browns are usually like just a really dark version of orange if you want to cheat. I know like a little cheat code about making browns. Just find a nice orange and then darken it up and you've got brown. <laughs> okay, so we've got his head and his head right now looks very much just like regular old vector art. Now this can be really useful if you wanted to, let's say you're more comfortable with, with shading and painting and stuff in Photoshop. Right now, as this project is, because I didn't add any, um, any sort of fancy colors, it's all just very basic shapes, basic colors. I can go ahead and go to the export menu, which again is under this thing that looks sort of like a piece of paper being lifted up with an ellipses. I can go to export and we have a bunch of different options here. PNGs are really great. Um, I like working with those better than JPEGs because JPEGs lose their quality over time. GIF, GIF, I say GIF. TIFFs are nice, um, especially if you're working with like 3D texturing. Then we get into some of the other stuff. I don't exactly know what EXR is. Um, and I'm not sure how an HDR file type would work with this software. I haven't really played around with it too much. The ones I've played around with the most so far have been JPEG, EPS, and PSD because I was sort of curious, um, especially if you use some of the shading techniques that this software has, which we'll get into in a second, um, and you try to export out that as an EPS, it doesn't want to accept the, the high rendered shading. It, it, w it basically wants to turn it all into very flat shapes, flat colors. Um, so it's great if you've got like a very basic logo that you want to show someone or throw into another software to work with and make it a little bit more nice. Um, EPS is great, but you don't want to go too far with your image. You know, you want to leave it base very, very basic and then you're able to go in and export in EPS, which loads into Illustrator and a bunch of other different softwares. PDFs, um, they're the most universal, more or less, um, file type. Um, and then there's PSD, Photoshop file. This is what I've, uh, EPS and PSD are really, really useful because, um, again, you can kind of get a lot of the grunt work, um, done with the iPad on the go, and then you could throw these software, these program, I'm sorry, these files 
as they're exported into your desktop at home, if you've got like the Adobe Creative Cloud or even the Affinity Suites for desktop, and you can work on them even more there and get a little bit more control that way. I do find that the iPad version of this software is amazing. I mean, you have so many different things that you can do that, are, that mimic everything that a desktop can do and more. It's really, really, really intuitive and I love it so much. The PSD files, again, can really only be opened in like Photoshop. So you kind of, you know, you're a little bit limited. You can't go back and really edit your vectors um, as easily as you could with an EPS. But again, it's, it's still pretty handy. Let's go ahead and start talking about coloring. I'm pretty sure, as far as I know, Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator does not allow you to get really, really nicely rendered texture with your with your colors. They do have like a gradient mesh tool, which is pretty useful. Um, and you can add some text, like some like texture overlays to kind of try and mimic paints and stuff like that. But it's it's not quite like this. And I'll show you why this uh, affinity symbol here represents the fact that we're, we're, we have all these menus that are geared towards actually creating our, our base image to work with. Then we come over to our pixel persona. Oh, here we go. Vector persona, pixel persona. We have a nice little pop-up message there in the center. Very nice. So you'll notice if you look on the the right side, I'm sorry, the left side of my screen, the menu options change. So right now we've got our move tool, node tool. I didn't get into some of these other these other tools. I haven't really played around with them too, too much. Um, but we use the pen tool and the shape tool. And I just showed you the very basics of the, the text tool. We go into our pixel persona and we've still got the move tool, but we have all these other options. This is where you actually do your painting. Your menu on the, the right side is pretty much exactly the same. You, know, you can pick your color, you can pick, you know, weights of strokes, your layers and everything. Down here at the bottom, we've got options to change the width, the opacity, the flow. Um, if you're familiar with painting, some of these, some of these terms might make sense to you. Um, width is basically talking about how thick your paintbrush is. So you can see I'm getting like a larger paintbrush size, I'm getting a smaller paintbrush size depending on how I go across. And the way I'm doing that is you can either tap on it and type in like, oh, I need exactly a 60 sized brush and it'll give you that. Or you can tap on the circle and drag left and right and really quickly change the size of your brush. So I'm gonna say I need a, I don't know, what is that, like two, 225 or so sized brush. Opacity will control basically how watered down your 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 color will be. Flow affects. It's hard to describe. It's kind of like how how much paint comes out at a time. When you pair that with opacity, you can get some really nice sort of like brush effects. Some really like nice like dry brush or you know wet brush and, and stuff like that. Hardness, which you can actually see in the circle right next to it, affects how sharp the edges are of your brush. So we can have it be really, really soft or perfect pixel sharp on the edges. And then we've got some options here we can turn on that affect the pressure of your brush. So if you're someone that likes to be able to really f like feel your, your stylus on your tablet very as realistically as possible, you can have that. Or you can have basically the amount of paint mimicking real life. So Obviously, in real life, if you gob up a bunch of paint on your brush and you start painting, eventually you're going to run out. So these two options mimic a lot of real-world applications of your paintbrush. Over on the right now, we can actually use our brushes palette. So, and they call it the brushes studio. So you have a bunch, they give you a bunch of presets in here. Um, so let's, okay, so let's go ahead. I know that he is sort of like... A little bit rust like he's not quite rusty old but he's definitely very very weathered so let's go ahead and start with his head minus the goggles we're just going to start with the the head part and i'm going to pick let's see let's go with textured acrylic brush and if i just whoop, does it show up yeah it does show up a little bit it's I should use a different color though so you can actually see it. So you can change the color up in your top right or you can change it down below. Um, it's up to you. You know, you have a lot of the same sliders. I think actually pretty much all the same sliders. Um, this is where the wheel actually comes in very handy. So you can pick your, your base color and then you can pick 
the, sh the tinder shade of it. He's such a bright yellow. I think I want to dull him down a little bit. So I'm going to pick kind of like a yellowy, a yellowy orange color to start with. And I'm just going to bring that down and really kind of dull him up a little bit. Give him a little bit of dull texture. And uh-oh, what's going on here? Well, let me show you an important step to make sure that you're always painting in the lines. One of the cool things that you can do is you can basically make kind of like a window mask that only will select certain areas. So again, this is one of the reasons why making closed shapes is really, really useful because if I, you know, if this, this part of his head here wasn't like fully closed in, I might not be able to use this tool the way I want to. And basically you go to the plus sign to make a new layer. And instead of making another vector layer, because again, we're in the pixel persona, we would make a pixel layer. And what I can do is I can turn this pixel layer into kind of like a window over top of one of my curves. So now watch what happens when I paint. It stays in the lines perfectly. It doesn't, doesn't go out at all. And that's really, really useful. I can't even begin to describe to you how much I love the way that that works. You can already see that this is like really nicely tarnishing up this golden color a little bit for me. One other thing I'll show you is, so we're in the layers palette right now. There is a really cool thing. They call it the navigator. And what this does is if we unlock it, I can now, using two fingers, I can rotate my my project. And I love being able to do this, especially when I'm doing the painting because I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to like twist their tablet around. I like to be able to just manipulate around um, with my fingers. So this is uh, super, super, super handy. And um, I'm trying to think, I think Photoshop has something like this. Uh, and Illustrator, as far as I know, currently does not. So that's something that Affinity Designer also has going for it, especially when you pair it with the ability to do this painting. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. Still looks pretty flat. So let's see, let's go back into our layers and let's add another pixel layer. What I would recommend, instead of using the same pixel layer and like, you know, let's say I wanna go like really, really dark with it now, instead of doing all of your shading and stuff on one single pixel layer, make new pixel layers because you're gonna, you're gonna thank yourself later if you wanna go back and change the colors and stuff like that. So I'm gonna make a new pixel layer. And again, to make it kind of like a window over top of something so you stay in the lines, you can just drag it and drop it right on top. And now we've got a new layer we can come in and do even more painting. All right, so, uh, I mean, obviously I can, I can push this a lot further, but I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I hope that this tutorial covered a lot of the basics that you had questions about um, last last time I made, or the first with the first tutorial I made. Um, again, I apologize. I was just so excited. I didn't have a mic or anything on me, so I, you know I wasn't able to like really make it uh, a nice a nice like standout kind of full tutorial. I was just sort of eking out. So hopefully this helped, and hopefully if you've got more questions. Um, I might be able to answer them in the comments or perhaps um, even make a new video. Sort of sort of up to you guys. I'm not really too picky. I, I tend to focus more on like creating like films and and music videos and stuff like that. but I mean if the tutorials help people, I'm all about I'm all about spreading knowledge and helping out as best I can. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much for watching. I hope this was helpful again. and uh, yeah, catch you around. Bye.